now by Jim Talent, former senator from the great state of Missouri, at Jim Talent on Twitter. I saw your uh, your success or an interest, uh, Senator Blunt, this week. Senator Talent, I believe you were out at the Reagan Defense Forum. What did you see? What do you hear? And what's the mood? Well, I tell you, I thought it was the best uh, Reagan Forum ever. It was the seventh. Um, I, I, it was a it was a great gathering of everybody who's interested in national defense. Our friend Robert O'Brien gave a really good speech in Hammond on the 350 ship Navy. You've been talking about that. There was a big focus on innovation, and I just finished co-chairing a task force for the Reagan Foundation on that. You know, I thought the mood was okay. We've come to grips with the problem, which is the the competition with China. And we're beginning to really come to grips with, with what we need to do to win it. Uh, but there's a lot of hard questions that have to be answered and a lot of work ahead. So, I, you know, I, I've said this before you. I think the Trump administration deserves credit for really shifting the direction of the ship of state in terms of foreign and national security policy towards what is the priority mission. And that's great power competition. Now, in terms of GPC, uh, which is everywhere now uh, back in vogue, who is the leading light intellectual? I was just talking about Robert Kaplan with Admiral Stavridis, who has written extensively on Asia's Cauldron. I've talked about Michael Pillsbury. Who do you look to? I mean, for uh, for information about China or expertise about China? Yep. Pillsbury, yeah, Pillsbury's very good. Uh, I look for, like, Derek Scissors on the economy. If you read Derek, who's at AEI, he really calls that tune. Uh, and I, I have, you know, I serve on the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. We put out an extensive report every year. Now, it's long, but we put out an executive summary. We're doing it for 20 years. Uh, I haven't been on it for 20 years. But that's very influential, and I would encourage people to look at it. Uh, it's uscc.gov. There's a lot of good information out there now, you, and I really, I'm encouraged by the uh, very strong bipartisan sentiment in favor of engaging and winning this competition. Now, did you read Acting Secretary Maudley's memo on getting to 355 in a hurry? Finally, someone wrote a memo. Yes, and uh, although, you know, it's kind of similar, isn't it, to what Jerry Hendricks and and O'Brien wrote a couple years ago, which is, look, we need a good mix of high and low end. We need to do some things in the short term, like bringing some ships out of retirement, you know, we maintain, we should be maintaining and have maintained those ships in fairly decent shape. So we need to do two things at the same time, Hugh, and this is across all the services. We need to build capacity, which is the size of the force. We need inventory. We need assets. We need people in various theaters. And we also have to build capability, which is rebuilding our technical superiority. Hypersonics is the poster child for that. We were ahead. We're behind now. We got to catch up. Now, Jim Talent, where do we go to find the new design for the submersible? I was just talking with Stan Readers about this, the submersible of 10 years from now that can go silently and quietly on a fairly direct mission that doesn't require a lot of sailors, but but does have lethality or capability and intelligence. Who's building that? You're talking about unmanned underwater vessels. Well, I mean, the Navy, the Navy has been working on it. I don't know. I mean, if Stab doesn't know, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to be more expert than him. Uh, But, you know, I think the Navy, again, we got to simplify this process. You we need we need we need uh, tight, tight lines of of accountability from the the service secretary, the chiefs to the under in charge of 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 shipbuilding and down through the Navy, a tight line of decision making and accountability. We need to give them authority and responsibility. And we need to insist that they deliver in a short time frame. I mean, John Lehman told me that's how they did it in the 80s. And if we're going to do it now, that's how we're going to do it. I do feel with Esper at the top, we have a team now that is doing that. As I said, I think at least they're asking the right questions now, which is it it was a very encouraging weekend. Now, I am going to uh, close by asking you, I'm going to play next hour a lot of the Judiciary Committee hearing yesterday. Uh, yeah, good. Were, were you shocked by that? I mean, as a senator who's held some of those hearings? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really discouraged by this whole thing. You called it at the beginning, you. I mean, the Democrats are committing a category error, okay? The question here is, is a president forbidden from pursuing what would otherwise be a legitimate policy? Because he may or allegedly has a political motive in addition to a policy motive for pursuing it. And the answer is no. Trump had a legitimate basis for asking the Ukraine 
to investigate corruption, and in particular, Burisma and Hunter Biden. I mean, it's a walking conflict of interest. So did he have a political? It doesn't matter. I mean, they're committing a category error here. You, all you got to do is ask yourself this. Do, do the Democrats have a political motive at all on what they're doing with impeachment? Yeah, they do. Yeah, but the course. question is, is there a substantive legal and constitutional basis for it? I think the answer is no. But that's the question, not whether they think they're going to get some political benefit from it. Exactly. They have made that error. They are committed to it. They are now stuck in it. And it's a self-inflicted political wound, which is large gaping and growing larger.